Hello and welcome to News Click. Today we are going to discuss the COVID-19 situation, not only in India but across the world, and what are the possible, what can we say, trends that we can talk about today. We have with us Dr. Satyajit Rat, who has been with us throughout this pandemic, and hopefully will stay with us till it is over. Satyajit, good to have you with us. Couple of quick questions that I know this is something a little. Uh, painful for you because you ask this every time. Are we looking again at a fourth wave or not? Because if you look at the world, in some of the places, we have about five, six countries, so the numbers seem to have gone up fairly significantly. 30,000, 40,000 has come down again. In India, numbers seem to be going up also, but rather slowly in some of the cities. And it seems to be that these are not really the kind of uh, wave that we have seen earlier, meaning very sharp rises, but slow rises. So maybe you would call it a ripple. So how do we differentiate when is it a wave, likely to be a wave, and when it is merely, you know, some numbers going up because of relaxation of uh, norms, people not wearing masks, people party, which is also what's happened, not only here, but in the US, as you know, even the uh, leading lights of the establishment have been parting and have come down heavily with COVID. So how would you distinguish between what is a ripple and what is a new wave? So um, let's make two or three points clear. Firstly, as you implied, we are really not uh, that interested in numbers alone anymore. What we are really asking is, should we be worried all over again? And in order for us to answer that question, um, the three issues that make the answer uncertain is, firstly, it's no longer clear if we are counting case numbers as reliably as we were a few months ago. This introduces enormous uncertainties into the counting game. Secondly, even though this uncertainty is there, the one factor that all of us seem to be ignoring is the fact that hospitalizations and what's more, clearly COVID ascribed death numbers are not rising, even in the places where over the past three, four weeks, there have been sort of case number rises. Death numbers are not rising. Anecdotal reports say hospitalization numbers are not rising anywhere to the same extent, all of which would be expected if mild infection transmission is happening in primarily vaccinated communities with the many Omicron lineages. The last point that I want to make that rather than reducing the uncertainty compounds it, is that in addition to not counting cases appropriately, we don't seem to be paying attention to mapping variants. So one of the few countries in the world which has been leading variant mapping has been South Africa. And as an unfortunate result, there are three variants that people are again referring to as South African lineages, which we should not, we should simply say, they belong to the Omicron group of uh, virus strains, but they are sort of descendants in the Omicron lineages. They're called BA4, BA5, et cetera. And um, those two or three um, descendant strains have some reason to carry potential for increased spread and or increased severity. None of that is proven anymore. It surprises me that countries across the world are not taking those lessons to heart and are not enhancing variant surveillance. Um, clearly in India, there is, uh, um, after a few weeks of uh, fairly coordinated effort, the variant uh, surveillance consortium has not provided any regular data output into the public domain. So we have no idea what's going on. Um, and, 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 and given that testing has now become sporadic, 
it won't surprise anybody if variant surveillance has become equally sporadic because variant surveillance was dependent on testing. So the, on the one hand, there is a great deal of uncertainty. On the other hand, we do seem to be in the waning phases of, of the pandemic and therefore numerical ups and downs are going to be local and um, frequent, but transient. As you noted, it's in um, Delhi, Bangalore, Mumbai, that case numbers are rising. They're not uniformly rising across the country. But on the other hand, hospitalization deaths and deaths don't seem to be rising. That's sort of a summary, if you like. Satyajit, that's interesting what you're saying, that effectively, when you look at numbers, these are, as I've said earlier, quoting you in some discussion, there are more ripples than peaks. And unless a new variant emerges, probably this is what we'll continue to see. And I don't know when the experts will say this is endemic from pandemic. That will leave for another discussion. But effectively, all bets are going to be off if you have a new strain. And then, of course, we'll have to see all over again. And new strains can be descendants of the current strains, or as we have seen with Omicron, some old strain a new lineage arising from that against which we don't have that many amount of defenses. Omicron, in that sense, had a population which already had seen various infections, vaccines, and so on. So it didn't prove that dangerous. What would it have done if it was completely to a naive population, meaning no uh, immunity whatsoever? We don't know. So given, given all those caveats, on to the other issues which we are now talking about. And again, these are to some extent artifacts, I will say, of statistics, which you already referred to, how many were testing, what we are seeing. Uh, one interesting uh, anomaly, if you will, that case fatality ratios are seen to be rising while we are saying Omicron is a much, uh, much less dangerous in terms of putting people in the hospital. So how do you account for this? So, um, so let's get again these uh, the difference between numbers and ratios in perspective. Death numbers are not rising, particularly dramatically. They are pretty much low now all over the world. And um, while there is some noise, there is no sustained steady increase in death numbers um, anywhere that I'm particularly aware of. However, what is showing a great deal of uh, noise, rise, whatever, is case fatality rate. Now, the rate is not a number. The rate is a ratio. The numerator is the uh, number of deaths. The denominator is the number of cases. The number of cases meaning how many people tested positive for the virus. Now, how many people tested positive is going to be determined in large part by how many people were tested in the first place. Number one. And number two, how many of the people who were testing reported their test in the second place to the documentation process? Both of these have now become extremely unpredictable and sporadic. Total case, uh, test numbers are dropping in various places. The groups of individuals who are being tested are uh, shifting characteristics. You know, some people are getting tested uh, only because they are sick rather than they're being statistically uh, sampled testing. And there is a great deal of home testing from which no report is coming to the documentation processes. As a result of this, in the ratio calculation, the numerators are what the numerators are because people die in hospitals. The denominator, which is the total number of positive cases, is fluctuating all over the place as a result of these uncertainties. It's not surprising that in some places the case fatality rate is apparently rising. And I would suggest that we pay really no attention to the case fatality rate. And we simply dismiss it as a consequence of the fact that we are no longer testing and reporting even as systematically as we were doing a few months ago. In fact, a lot of the people who get tested COVID is because they're already in the hospital for other reasons. And then, of course, it enters into the case fatality ratio because they came sick with some other disease which needed hospitalization. Incidentally, the tests show they have also COVID. And so, of course, that skews the case fatality ratio if 
they are as serious cases for other reasons or they die. So yes, the artifacts of the, all of this must be brought in fact, must be brought in mind because a lot of this is how you create the data that seems to suggest a result which is contraindicated to what really it is. And that is why this, you also have the statement the status lies, damn lies in statistics and you have to be very careful about how you analyze it. Satyajit, another point that we also seem to have this vaccine debate going on and that again is with respect to numbers that some vaccines are supposed to be more efficacious, some vaccines are not so good and there is this concerted campaign coming from the West that how the Chinese vaccines are bad, the Covaxin is not good, Covid shield somehow goes into a black hole, it is not mentioned but what is mentioned repeatedly is the fact that mRNA vaccines have shown much more efficacy and the quotes are like 90 percent, 93 percent, 80 percent, 87 percent, etc., etc., very high figures compared to 53, 55, 65, 70 for other vaccines. Now the question is, is of course it does not take into account when you say this that you should only use mRNA vaccines because it needs cold chain which we know in a large part of the world is not possible. So what you do is of course create the demand that public health system should buy expensive vaccines, create a cold chain essentially so that a few companies, pharma companies have monopoly. But how good is this so called numbers of efficacy which are being trotted out at the drop of a hat that A is better, B is not so good and also not taking into account how long the quote unquote antibodies from these vaccines last as another indicator for fighting against new variants that may emerge. So two questions really roll into one. So um, let's get a couple of issues uh, on the table about this. Firstly, comparing protective efficacy of different vaccines has not been done and in general actually honestly cannot be done since it would have to be done in randomized clinical trials. So what everybody is doing is comparing real life protective effectiveness rather than efficacy. These two words in lay language mean the same thing, but in technical language mean different things. Efficacy is in controlled uh, trials, effectiveness is in real life. What all of us are comparing these percentages that you talked about um, is effectiveness in real life. And those are not from randomized clinical trials. They are results from different populations. There is an enormous amount of uncertainty and possibility of confounding. So uh, a robust, rigorous comparison really cannot be made, number one. Secondly, all of these percentages tend to set shifting goalposts. All vaccines have been formally rigorously tested and approved for usage on the basis that they protect against severe disease and death, not on the basis that they protect against infection and transmission of the virus. So asymptomatic and mild infection uh, modification by vaccines has always been known to be modest. Severe illness and death has been well protected against. At the severe illness and death level, pretty much all vaccines do a very good job. Whether there is a real difference between 80% protection versus 90% protection cannot be clarified in the absence of well-designed trials, but they do very good jobs. At the other end, asymptomatic and mild infections are only very modestly protected against. Added to this is the next layer of confusion, which is that as variants shift, Vaccines which are based on 2020 virus strains will inevitably, all of them, begin to show some reduction in effectiveness. But again, over the past six, eight months, it has become very clear that reduction in the protective uh, um, protection effectiveness for severe illness and death is relatively small. It goes down from 80-85% to 75%. Its protection against asymptomatic or mild disease transmission, which goes down quite a bit from 50-55% to as low as 30-35%. 
In all of this, therefore, there is a great deal of matrix of confusion that is loaded onto an already um, uh, non-robust level of comparisons. Therefore, I think the WHO position, which does not practice vaccine discrimination, which clearly says that all COVID vaccines give very good protection against death due to COVID-19, and that protection against mild COVID-19 disease and transmission is much more modest with pretty much all vaccine strains is the only position that really needs to be taken serious. Now, as the last point, based on this background, it's very clear that very few of the claims made in public discourse that you are pointing out about COVID vaccines, even acknowledge any of these uncertainties, leave alone discuss them. So clearly, they read like tactics in advertising wars, whether the advertising is in support of purely commercial purposes or commercial political nationalist purposes. Thanks. Therefore, what we should really talk about is the availability of the vaccine and the availability to be able to reach that vaccine to the people. Therefore, also the effectiveness of the public health system. And let's face it. mRNA vaccines are unsuitable in this context for large parts of the world, precisely because they need a cold chain, which most countries, most poor countries do not have. They're already having problems being able to provide vaccines. Africa, for instance, still has about only 12 to 14 percent of its people having two shots, while rich countries have three shots and some of them are also looking at four shots. So given this, I think this should be seen more as a pharmaceutical company's game rather than as a public health issue. Because public health has to take availability and the ability to reach it to the people as well, not simply what is supposedly the vaccine efficacy. Last point, Satyajit, a bit of uh, Indian health nationalism, if you will. Indian researchers have shown that Montelukasts, which is used by a lot by asthmatics like me, for instance, have some protective uh, qualities against infection by uh, COVID, by SARS-CoV-2. What is the evidence for that? Is it something which is interesting but yet to be really validated fully? Where are we on that? So um, uh, it's an interesting research finding. It comes from the Indian Institute of Science in Bangalore. Um, uh, and um, the way uh, that computational analysis has been put together with actual um, real uh, wet bench experiments to show this is, is, is really very nice. Um, that said, we have to keep in mind the past two and a half years of empirical evidence. In fact, the past many decades of antiviral drug research, but in the COVID context, the past two and a half years of empirical evidence that so-called drug candidates which prevent virus growth in the test tube do not necessarily show clinical utility in real life in patients. So um, this is, at this point, this is simply a very early phase interesting finding um, and really nothing more than that. And I don't think anybody should be rushing out and buying Montelukas uh, or, or you know, uh, drugs of that sort. Um, added to which is a point about antiviral drugs, which we've been making in these conversations for the past two years, which has been proven again and again in COVID uh, cases. All the antiviral drugs in COVID-19 that have been shown to work, remdesivir, molnupiravir, um, Pfizer's combination called Paxlovid, the monoclonal antibodies, which is really the even more expensive uh, uh, versions that Roche and Regeneron are selling. All of these function as specific antiviral drugs that interrupt the viral life cycle and they show clinical utility only if taken very early during the symptomatic phase of the disease. Meaning that if you've had symptoms for more than about three or four days, taking any antiviral drug is unlikely to 
increase your chances of changing your recovery trajectory. And as a result, the real issue with these drugs is not so much do we have drugs, do we need more drugs, but to be able to have oral drugs, drugs like Paxlovid, the Pfizer drug, and to be able to have them available in large amounts for early quick diagnosis and easy accessibility at affordable prices for everybody who's had 24 hour symptoms for COVID-19. If this is going to make any dramatic difference on the one hand to the epidemic. On the other hand, it is important for people with known immune compromised situations. People who are undergoing cancer therapy, people who are undergoing, who've had transplants, people who are undergoing uh, um, immune suppressions for autoimmune diseases, rheumatoid diseases of a variety of kinds, that they should get tested for COVID-19 very early. And at those very early stages, they should have access to these drugs. In none of this is the range of new antivirals the limiting factor. We already have um, remdesivir, molnupiravir, monoclonals, paxlovid. Adding more and more drugs is not the point. The implementation of a public health policy and program is the stumbling block. If Montelukast is off patents, then the price will be much lower. So wouldn't that make it oh, absolutely. easier drug to use? Absolutely, yes. But I'm, I'm still arguing for the broader point. We are in the middle of a pandemic. Why on earth are we allowing commercial profiteering interests to trump public health needs? Whether the drug is an old drug or a new drug should make no difference to how we look at drug availability and implementation of public health policies. Which means we should break the remdesivir patent and make it widely available that we can do under the current Indian Drug uh, Act that we have the uh, basically the ability to do so. And so has most countries, because I think all countries have the provision during pandemic or epidemic, they're allowed to break patents or do what is equivalent to breaking of patents. Right. Okay, so yes, interesting, but we have to see what happens. But even if it does not prove efficacious, there are other drugs which we can break patents, make it cheaply available. And Satyajit says, why is it that we are not starting to do so, in spite of the fact that India and South Africa have gone to WTO to say, in this period of COVID-19 pandemic, patents should not be enforced, or they should be compulsory licensing should be followed, and countries should be allowed to do so. Actually, the countries have the power to do so, why they haven't done so is still an open question. And that's what Professor Rath is raising with us, or raising with all and sundry, including the drug authorities of our countries. Thank you, Satyajit, for being with us, explaining to us the intricacies of looking at numbers of pandemic, looking at how we should read these numbers, as well as how the pandemic should be judged in its, in its current course of development development or waning, whichever way it is at the moment, and how should we look at the future, not only for the pandemic, but also for the drugs and the vaccines that have come in this period. Thank you very much. We'll also be in touch with you, discuss these issues with you as and when we think something new has arisen on the horizon, which we need to address. This is all the time we have today for News Click discussing COVID-19. Do log into our website and do go to our YouTube channel.